Welcome to 13 Cubed. In this episode, we're going to be taking a look at the new Windows subsystem for Linux version 2 and using it to run the newest public beta of Volatility 3. I think you'll be amazed at how well these technologies work together. So let's take a step back. What is WSL? Well, if you're not familiar, this is an optional feature in Windows 10 that we can turn on that enables us to run Linux command line tools directly alongside Windows which is pretty awesome. WSL2 was introduced with Windows 10 version 2004. So let's take a look at the differences between version 1 and 2. In version 2, it's now a fully managed VM, which provides us access to the full Linux kernel and full system call compatibility, which is a huge improvement. That means we can run tools like Nmap, which didn't really work correctly with WSL1, underneath the new WSL2 and it works fine. So that's awesome. You'll notice I've highlighted the runs with current versions of VMware and VirtualBox line because that is a caveat. You can see the red X there under WSL2 and that's because on the back end, this is running a Hyper-V virtual machine. That said, if you've updated to VMware Workstation 15.5, it now supports host Hyper-V mode and these things can coexist. As an example, on this machine that I'm using to record this episode, I actually have Workstation 15.5 installed, and I also have WSL2 installed, and they seem to work together with no issue. So that's an important caveat you have to keep in mind. Now, if you already have WSL version 1 enabled on your system, you can update to version 2, and you'll see this article right here, which explains how to do it. I'll leave a link in the episode's description so you can take a look at how to do that yourself. Now, coming up next, what we're going to do is take a look at how to turn on the feature on this version 2004 machine that we're looking at here. It's actually already enabled, but I'll show you how to do it. And then we'll open the Microsoft Store, and I'll show you where to go to download a Linux distro that you can use inside of WSL2. We're actually going to be using Ubuntu 20.04, and it works just like you would think it would, and almost like just running a separate virtual machine in VMware. Except the advantage here is that we can just pop open Windows Terminal, then pop open that particular Ubuntu shell, and we're good to go. It's completely, very tightly integrated with the operating system and super fast to access. So why is this important? Well, it means that all of those Linux forensics tools that we often use in our investigations can potentially work natively within WSL2 without us having to spin up a separate virtual machine or have you know all the different configuration issues that we often run into when we're switching around machines and moving images from one place to another. So it really can provide us quite a bit of advantage, and I think you'll see that when we take a look at Volatility 3. So let's go ahead and get started. All right, let's go ahead and start typing the word feature, and we'll click on Turn Windows Features On or Off. In this dialog box, we'll scroll to the very bottom and then we'll see Windows Subsystem for Linux, which is checked here, but will be unchecked by default. So you simply put a check in the box and press OK. And after a couple of minutes, it will install WSL and prompt you to reboot. Once you've done that, you've got the base subsystem installed, but then you need to actually choose a Linux distribution to run within WSL. So you'll open the Microsoft Store, as we're doing here, and in the top right, where it says search, we'll simply type in Linux. And as you notice, there are several different distros to choose from. I'm going to choose Ubuntu 20.04. And of course, on this machine, it is already installed, but you would simply click the blue install button otherwise and wait a couple of minutes, and then it will be ready for you. It will also prompt you during the initial launch to create a username and password. Again, all of that is already done on this particular system. We're also going to be using the new Windows Terminal. So if I type in Terminal here, you'll actually see it right here. This is an awesome utility that serves as a replacement for cmd.exe, powershell.exe, and bash.exe, which is actually what you use to interact with WSL. So that's what we're going to be using in the next part of this episode, where we take a look at using Volatility 3 within WSL 2. So let's check it out. On the desktop, you'll notice the Volatility 3 directory. Off camera, I did a git clone and pulled down the newest version from the official GitHub repo. There'll be a link in the description. I have Windows Terminal already opened, 
And as you can see, we're in the root of my home directory. Let's go ahead and change into the desktop. And then in this location, we should find that volatility three directory that we just looked at. So let's go ahead and change into this location. And there we should find the root of volatility three. Let's run vol.py without any arguments just to make sure it works. And it seems to. Notice this is volatility three version 1.0.0 beta one. While I was filming this, 1.1 actually came out. And by the time you're watching this, I'm sure there's a much newer version because this is actively being developed. Let's go back to the desktop and check out memory.raw. This is the Windows 10 version 2004 memory dump that we're going to be analyzing. So let's run vol.py dash F. It is up a directory, so dot dot slash memory dot raw. Remember, there is no dash dash profile in volatility three, which is awesome. And then let's run PS list, only it's not PS list. It's windows dot PS list dot PS list. And the second repetition of PS list has a capital P and a capital L. This is critical. If you do not have the capitalization correct, it will not work. I don't know why they chose this new nomenclature, but I guess it has something to do with organizing the plugins from the various operating systems. This is real time, by the way, I haven't sped this up. And as you can see, it almost immediately provided a process listing for us. Notice the column header at the top. These things are in a different order than you may be used to with volatility 2.x. As we scroll down through here, things look like they should, right? Everything looks so far so good. Down at the bottom though, we do see an error where it had some issues parsing this memory image. This has nothing to do with the fact that it's running in WSL2 because I tested this on an Ubuntu 18.04 machine and had the same results with the same capture. So again, just remember this is beta. So check this out, lsaiso.exe, which should only be present if Windows Credential Guard is enabled, which I can tell you it is not. At the top, we'll notice that the first and second columns correspond to PID and PPID. So the PPID is 4356, which actually corresponds to cmd.exe, which of course has no business running lsaiso.exe, or at least not the legit lsaiso.exe. So already we see something that looks a little bit odd in this memory image. Also check out these multiple powershell.exe PIDs, which you know, may or may not be normal depending on whose system we're analyzing here. You can even see the magnet RAM capture process running, which is the tool I use to capture memory from this machine. So very self-explanatory, just like we would normally analyze a memory image, nothing too special here. Let's try another plugin. And this is PS tree. Unfortunately, I was unable to get this plugin to work again, has nothing to do with WSL two, same results on another Ubuntu machine. But again, this is beta, so hopefully this will be fixed. The other possibility is that it's just an issue with this particular memory image, which is from, as of this recording, the very newest version of Windows 10, 2004. Let's move on to PS Scan. Again, notice the weird capitalization with the P and the S in PS Scan. Now this I will actually speed up a little bit because it does take a lot longer to run. As a refresher, Remember that PS list and PS tree will follow that doubly linked list. PS scan, however, interrogates the memory image for those e process structures within memory, and it can actually help us find things that may belong to exited processes and also processes that may have maliciously unlinked themselves from that list in an effort to hide. That's called DCOM or direct kernel object manipulation. So PS scan is definitely a much more in-depth plugin, which is why it takes longer to run. As a general rule, anything with a plugin name of scan versus list is generally going to be more in-depth than its list counterpart. So at this point, I'll speed it up just a bit, and then we'll take a look at the output here. And as you can see, stuff's starting to be dumped to the screen. So let's go ahead and scroll back up to the top. And I've already highlighted the column header things are in mostly the same order that you should be used to with PID and PPID being at the very beginning, the leftmost side. But as we scroll through here, we'll see all of the processes. And remember, we might see things here that are exited or that have maliciously unlinked themselves. Let's move on to another plugin. How about, 
I don't know, CMD line. So CMD line will actually show us things that may have been typed into cmd.exe or powershell.exe. Remember that those things are actually located in the con host processes for which there will be one for each version of cmd.exe running on the system or powershell.exe or even bash.exe. Check this out. There's that LSA ISO process, PID 4892. And look at the command line. Any ideas what that might be? It certainly doesn't look normal to me. Looks like something is listening, perhaps. And looks like it might even be trying to provide a shell to cmd.exe. We can also see our svc host.exe processes with the familiar dash k flag, which should always be present. And as we scroll up through here, quite a bit of additional information that can prove very useful when analyzing memory images. Again, this is CMD line. Let's check out another plugin. How about DLL list? Which if we don't specify a PID, will literally provide every PID's DLLs, which is a lot of output as you will see in a second. So this is obviously very helpful in finding and analyzing malicious DLLs that may be present or associated with various processes on the system. Again, nothing new here. This is the same kind of functionality we had in the volatility two days. It is important to note that as in volatility two, we can narrow this down to a specific PID. It is actually the long form of that switch, which is dash dash PID. So not dash P, dash dash PID. So let's go ahead and run that and actually focus in on that PID that we already identified as being a little bit strange which is 4892. And when this finishes running, we'll get the output for the DLLs associated with that LSA ISO.exe process. And you can see them there. So that's kind of interesting. In fact, it looks like WoW64, which may be indicative of the fact that this is a 32-bit binary. So let's move on to another plugin. What else can we take a look at here? How about we check out another plugin called Proc dump, which you are probably familiar with. Again, notice the capitalization there. And if I do a dash H, once again, we have the ability to specify a PID and you already know which PID I'm going to specify. Our potentially malicious 4892. As I do this, what's going to happen is the process executable, if it hasn't been paged to disk and if it's present in memory, will be dumped to disk. And it looks like it worked. It's been stored in a file that starts with PID. And there's that file, approximately 57K in size. So it looks like we successfully dumped it from memory. If I run file against it, it is indeed a PE32 executable. So far, so good. Let's go ahead and run strings against it and see if we'll have any chance of potentially identifying what this is. Of course, we could also hash it or even upload it to virus total or something like that. There's the familiar, this cannot be run in DOS mode text. As we continue to page down through here though, Let's see if we see anything else. Ah, look at that. This appears to be Netcat for Windows, which indeed it is, masquerading as that LSA ISO.exe process. And you can see those command line arguments that we saw with the CMD line plugin. So very interesting. All I did was dump it from memory with procdump, or more specifically, windows.procdump.procdump, and then we ran strings against it. Fairly self-explanatory. Now, if I run a dash H here and pipe it through more, these are all of the plugins that are thus far available to us in Volatility 3 beta. You can see the grouping there, starting with Linux dot, Mac dot, so on and so forth. But these are all the plugins that are currently available in what I pulled down from the official GitHub repo. Also notice the Timeliner plugin, which is very handy. This will pull any relevant time-based artifacts out of memory. Very handy. There's actually a 13 cubed episode covering that. Check out the episode guide, by the way, 13 cubecom slash episodes. There's Malfind, which I've been playing around with. The output's a little strange for Malfind currently. It doesn't look anything like what you're used to with 2.x and quite a few other plugins available to us as well. I expect this list to continue to grow as Volatility 3 is continually developed. In fact, I have heard that this year in 2020, it will actually replace volatility two and actually go live as a non beta version. So we'll see how that works out. But 
I'm definitely very excited for the future development of Volatility 3. So that wraps up what I wanted to show you in this relatively quick episode. The key takeaway here is the fact that using WSL2, we can run Linux forensics tools directly alongside our Windows tools without having to spin up a separate VM. We're testing, of course, with Volatility 3, which is currently in beta. So keep that in mind. That's why we ran into a few errors as we tried to process various things. And also keep in mind that with memory forensics in general, there are no guarantees, right? What you're looking for in memory may or may not be there. Some of it is just luck. Has the thing been paged out to disk or is what you're looking for actually in the memory image? So this goes far beyond just volatility. Think about any other Linux tool that you would normally have to run in a dedicated virtual machine that you may potentially be able to run natively right there at the command prompt using Windows Terminal and WSL2. So this really can help our forensic investigations potentially a lot. I'm going to continue to play around with this and as I learn new things, I'll make new episodes covering what I've learned. If you guys have any experience with WSL2 and forensics tools, please do share them in the comments below. As always, thank you for watching, thank you for subscribing, and I'll catch you in the next 13 Cubed episode.